Thank you, Benita, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I want to start off with a story. It's actually a true story. In the mid-1970s, there was this weird guy. He, he was kind of strange. I actually knew him. And he was the manager of a service department at a mid-sized car dealership in Richmond, Virginia. And he had an idea. He said, I don't like the way that service departments work for cars. Because at that time, you would take your car in to get it fixed. And if they didn't fix it right, you brought it back. It just went to whatever mechanic was free next. It didn't necessarily go back to the person that, that messed up your car the first time. <laughs> and so he said, I want to create something called the team concept, where you take the car to a team of mechanics, and then if you bring the car back because it's not fixed properly, it goes back to the same team, and it goes back to the front of the line, and so they're not working on other cars for which they'd be getting paid. And instead of getting paid by the hour, now they'd be paid piece rate per car they fixed, you know, and per job. Well, this guy wanted to put this in at his car dealership in the mid-70s in Richmond, Virginia. And the owner said, no, that's a stupid idea. And the owner talked to the, the mechanics. They were like, that's a terrible idea. We, we want to get paid by the hour. And so the guy actually got fired because he wouldn't give it up. He went around to all the car dealerships in Richmond, Virginia and said, I got this great idea, I got this great idea. And the guy was kind of strange. Nobody listened. Finally, a second guy did listen. And he said to his boss, he was in charge of the service department at a different car dealership, a Ford car dealership, and he said, hey, can we put this in? And the boss was like, that's stupid. We've always paid them by the hour and, and talked to them, and the mechanics want to be paid by the hour. But the second guy wouldn't give it up, and so finally the boss said, fine. I put you in charge of the service department. You put it in, right? Now, pretty much every car dealership and every uh, place that services cars in the world uses this team concept. In the business world, that kind of story is not unusual. Some bourgeois guy, that's what the French would say, some regular schmo who's kind of <laughs> off has this idea. And it's a little idea, but it changes everything for the better. I know no one here is old enough to remember, but in the 1970s, when you took your car to get it fixed, it was often not fixed properly. Now it's fixed a lot better, right? Because the workers on the ground have an incentive to do it right because one weird guy had one little idea. I want to bring that to public education in the state of Georgia. And I call my report Georgia 2020, educational opportunity for all Georgia students. Because I think what I'm going to recommend today could be implemented in Georgia beginning in fall 2020. <laughs> We have some cool parental choice opportunities now in Georgia. We have a $58 million tax credit scholarship program, and we have the founder here, Jim Kelly, of the largest student scholarship organization in Georgia. We have the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship Program. We have an independent authorizer for charter schools, the Georgia Charter Schools Commission, and we have staff from them here today. We have virtual schools. We have the board chair of the largest virtual schools up here a minute ago. We have 180 traditional public school districts. Ten years ago, Georgia was a leader in educational choice in the nation. We are now a laggard. <laughs> 58 million for the, the tax credit scholarship program for the current school year is less than three tenths of one percent of what we spend on public education in this state. We have 97 startup charter schools, which is about a four percent market share. The average special needs scholarship, think about this, special needs students have extra needs compared to other students. The average special needs scholarship is about half what we spend on public school students in Georgia. The students with the most needs get half. Right? Startup charter schools, they receive a lot less funding than traditional public schools on a per student basis. Instead, we have what I call the 13 layer cake education system. Right? You've got, Kelly told me to take this off if I walk around. You've got classroom and teachers, classroom teachers and students here, but they've got 13 bosses that make policy for their classroom. Elected officials and, and, and government agencies. President, Congress, USDOE, Governor, General Assembly, Department of Education, Professional Standards Commission, Office of Student Achievement, University System even a little bit, Local Board of Education, Superintendent, Principal, Assistant Principal, 
All, and that's 13 layers that govern our schools in Georgia, our traditional public schools. And that 13 layer cake system has a 95% market share of, of taxpayer subsidized students in Georgia. Why should Georgia pursue universal educational choice? There is research on this because we've had some small scale school choice programs in this country now for, for quite some time. And people that say, oh, there's no evidence that school choice works, that, that's just not a true statement. And when you get my report at the end, you'll, you'll see that I cite a bunch of it. Um, one, one important finding is that over 30 studies, over 30, find that students who remain in traditional public schools are better off when some students leave from a school choice program. One study finds they're worse off. Over 30 versus one, right? Two studies find that there's really no effect, right? So when people say, oh, we don't want school choice because we need to work on all schools, there it is, right there, right there. That benefits all schools, even kids who don't actively choose. Second thing I want to say is the evidence is that the gains from school choice for students who choose isn't going to be on test scores. It's going to be on post-secondary success and later life outcomes. But think about this. Why would some kind of education change not have much effect on test scores, maybe a small positive effect, but then have all these other benefits? Right? Two reasons. One is a paper Jim Kelly and I wrote. We surveyed Gold Scholarship recipients and their parents, and we said, why did you choose the schools you did? Why did you leave private public school and go to this private school with the Gold Scholarship? And we asked them a bunch of questions about, to that effect. They had very good reasons for making the choices they did, but higher standardized test scores was like the bottom priority. They cared about safety, they cared about values, they cared about getting their students to finish college. But that still wasn't persuasive to people. People were like, oh, that's just parent satisfaction, whatever, right? But a bunch of studies find this. Usually studies find that well north of 95% of families that make an active choice when they have a school choice program think that they made a good choice. But, but technocrats don't buy that evidence. Well, you know what? The research has finally caught up with parents what they knew all along. There's new research in the last 10 years about the benefits of non-cognitive outcomes. Non-cognitive things like grit, persistence, patience, behaving, those things lead to post-secondary attainment and later life outcomes that are beneficial for those, those children. Here's something interesting. Even like no excuses charter schools that really focus on getting test scores higher and that work, those kids often don't do well in college. So the undue focus on test scores might actually be harming more important life outcomes later on. To be fair, this research is only within the last 10 years and it's new, but what's interesting is it's consistent with what parents say they value when they choose schools. So again, the nerds might have caught up with the parents finally. Last thing is all the research on school choice it's, it's hard to get at the systemic evidence because if school choice is making all schools better, it's kind of hard to detect, right, a, a pattern between sectors. So you really need to look at the whole system. And I do that for Arizona. And instead of the movie Raising Arizona, I call it Rising Arizona. <laughs> Since 2007, when Georgia started our embarkment onto school choice, you know, we passed the Georgia Special Needs Scholarship Program. Since that time, Arizona has had a very robust system of educational choice among traditional public schools, charter public schools, cyber schools, and five taxpayer-funded scholarship programs to private schools. Just to give you an example, charter schools, brick-and-mortar charter schools in Arizona, receive 92% of the funding of traditional public schools in Arizona which is a far higher percentage than we have in Georgia. So I look at the period 2007, when we started school choice, to 2015, because by, that's the most recent data I can get. By 2007, Arizona's program of choice was robust. During that period, 
Arizona public schools faced more severe funding challenges than we did in Georgia. They spent a lot less per student than we did in Georgia, but they experienced much higher test score gains on the NAEP test, a national test. Taxpayers funded students in Arizona and Georgia. In Arizona, only 79% of students that receive taxpayer funding for their education go to a traditional public school. 15% in Arizona go to a charter school, 6% exercise private school choice. In Georgia, it's 95% of our students that receive subsidies go to a traditional public school, 4% charter, 1% private school choice. Public school spending per student, and this includes charter schools. In 2007, Georgia spent 1,700 more per student than Arizona. The cost of living is 5% higher in Arizona than in Georgia on a statewide basis. But they spent 1,700 less. During the Great Recession and its aftermath, every state had funding challenges because the economy was so bad. Georgia lost 200 and some bucks per student, Arizona 300 and some bucks. So by the end, 2014, the most recent comparable data I can get, Arizona public schools spent 1,800 per student less than Georgia public schools. Eighth grade reading scores on the NAEP test. NAEP is a, an agency that's independent, nominally, that's attached to the federal government. They give tests to a sample of students in your state from public schools, charter schools, and private schools. So these numbers are gains for the whole state, which includes non-traditional public school students. So from 2007 to 2015, in the United States, eighth grade reading scores went up two points. In Arizona, eight, in Georgia, three. So Georgia's doing pretty good, but not as good as Arizona. Math score is eighth grade. Arizona had higher gains than Georgia. Georgia had higher gains than the national average. Same thing for fourth grade, they're in the report. College graduation rates, right? These numbers are lower than the truth because it's hard to track students that transfer out of systems. So if a student leaves Kennesaw State and maybe goes to a technical college or goes to a private college, it, their counter doesn't drop out. And that's true everywhere. So these are within public university system graduation rates. In 2008-2010, I, I explained in the report, I couldn't get comparable data for the same years. Georgia and Arizona had about similar graduation rates. But look at Arizona's college graduation rate went up five points by 2017. Georgia's went up by you know, 1.7 points. Of course the colleges are responsible for some of this. But I'm telling you, I'm a college teacher and I teach freshmen. Having better prepared students <coughs> makes a dramatic effect on how well the students will do at my university. Right? So, so what I want to say is, if you look at the system, clearly in Arizona, They've dramatically expanded school choice, and the wheels haven't fallen off. They've had more severe funding challenges, and they spend less than us, and the wheels haven't fallen off. Right? So that's one reason why I want to recommend a robust system of universal school choice for Georgia. And here are my specific recommendations. First, education savings accounts. I think we should have universal education savings accounts, and I put the word universal in quotes, and you'll see why in a second. I want 90% of the average of all state funding. So that includes the QBE funding formula and everything else. Right? 90% of that per student, which going forward will be a little bit more than 5,000 a student. Give it to students that were in public schools previously or students who are in grades K through 1. Education savings accounts can be used to pay tuition at private schools. They can be used for um, state-approved education services outside of school walls. They can be moved to future years if you don't spend all the money, or they can be moved to your siblings. And you can even save these funds for college expenses. This gives families more choice because it lets you choose outside of the school walls. You can choose among private schools, but you can choose non-school service providers. But it also gives you incentive to be cost conscious because you can save that money. I would offer ESAs to homeschool students. I think virtually all of them will turn it down because they think the government's going to encroach on them. Right? Second, the tax credit scholarship program. 
I got an email the other day. My wife and I are donors to gold, right? We got an email that you know, you, you've been approved to give your contribution for 2018, but there was $105.5 million that taxpayers like me wanted to donate to this program, but the cap was $58 million. That was hit on the first business day of the year. This has been going on several years in a row, and more and more donations come in every year. For that reason, I think the cap should be $150 million with a 20% escalator clause every year the cap is hit. And I can't promise this, but if we went to $150 million, I bet you the cap would be hit on the first day again. Right? Um, this is a very popular program. Taxpayers love it. I I've said this before, and uh, probably at this venue, but I'll say it again. Let me tell you why I love this program. Nobody's money goes where they don't want it to go. Not one person. If you don't think parents should be allowed to choose private schools for their kids, don't give. If you think that private school is no good, earmark your money for that one. Right? If you think your donation should only go for special needs kids or for very low income kids, donate it with that restriction. Right? What other government program in human history has had 100% of taxpayers happy about where their money's going. I can't think of one either, right? I would leave this program alone and raise the cap. Okay, special needs students. It seems highly immoral to give them half the money that we give to average public school students, right? So what I would do is keep the special needs scholarship and just add the ESA on top of it and make the whole thing an education savings account because these are the students that are going to benefit the most from <coughs> choosing services, therapies outside of school walls. So this is fiscal year 2016 data. In fiscal year 2016, the average special needs scholarship was 56.56. The average ESA, if this program had been in effect in 2016, would have been about $4,500. If you add them together, that's $10,000 and change. That still would have been $1,000 less than we spent on average public school students in 2016. But still, it would be a huge enhancement into the choices that would be available to special needs families. Charter schools. I would give charter schools funding equal students equal to the students in traditional public schools. We expect charter schools to do more. I think we should expect them to do more with the same funding. Right? This gets wonky for 8.15 in the morning, so tune out if you want. Let's say, and I'm making the numbers big just to make a point. Let's say that this student right here, I'll pick a random person, Cabral, right? Let's say that in, in his community, he would have earned 1% of QBE dollars based on his grade level and based on the other categories of QBE. If, he, if we think as a state that he's worth 1% of the QBE dollars in his community, then why isn't he getting 1% of all non-QBE state dollars, 1% of federal dollars, 1% of local dollars? If that's what we think we should devote to his education. Then, and only then, would traditional public school students and charter public school students be funded equally based on their needs, right? I would give cyber charter schools two-thirds of this amount. Some of us here in this room, we looked at this several years ago, and two-thirds seem to be about the right number. All right. Charter school policy. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, because there's at least five of you here, and if you criticize me afterward, I'm going to call your name out. Right? <laughs> How many times, ten years ago, did we criticize Arizona charter schools as the wild, wild west? I think I told Governor Purdue when some of you made me be the first chair of the Georgia Charter Schools Commission, oh, Governor, don't worry. It's not going to be the wild, wild west like Arizona. We're not going to do it. And we all talked about it, right? Guess what? The wild, wild west was better, right? Arizona had the wild, wild west. They let their charter sector expand. They had light touch approval on the front end. They had 10-year charters. And their test scores skyrocketed. If you delve in to the data in Arizona, it was the charter schools that were leading those test score gains. Right? This is a quote from some, one of our friends, Matt Ladner. Dr. Ladner actually has lived in Arizona for many years, 
And among nerds, he has the most wisdom in terms of, and, and clearest eyes of, of probably anyone I know, offense <laughs> to all of us in this room. Right? And I, I just, I, I broke up his quote so we could parse it. And he said this not too long ago. If Arizona had five-year charters and default closures, like we have in Georgia and have pretty much every other state, we might have arbitrarily closed some schools which blossomed into very high-performing charter schools that now do a great job with disadvantaged kids. We would have made mistakes in Arizona if they closed schools early. Meanwhile, these schools faced a much harsher form of accountability. Hundreds of Arizona charter schools have closed, and their average length of existence is four years. So most states give five-year charters. So most of these schools close before the state would have closed them anyway. And in the last year, only 62 students were left. So parents abandoned these schools before the state would have acted. Why was that possible? If you live to see a five year, year five as an Arizona charter school, you're probably doing something right because everyone wants your students. Your home district wants your students if you're a charter school. Fancy school districts with high income families are playing the open enrollment game. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine expensive communities begging kids from other communities to come to our public schools? Because we need to fill empty seats. That's amazing. Other charter schools want your students and private schools want your charter school students because there are five private school choice programs in Arizona. Everybody wants your students. So you can have more choice and you don't need to regulate these schools. Let a thousand flowers bloom. The antidote to poor performing schools is more choice, not less. So I think that state charter school policy, instead of focusing on closing schools, should focus on expanding choice. And what I mean by that is, yes, we do give technical assistance to people trying to start a charter school and the charter schools are open, but make that more of a focus. And second, allow proven high quality charter school providers to open chains of schools in Georgia. A lot of these big providers that are, are successful in the Midwest and in the West, they won't come here because they can't open seven or 10 at a time. They want to. Kelly had an event about five years ago with some of these charter school providers. Two of them were Georgians and they will not open charter schools in Georgia because we don't let them open a bunch at once. If they have proof in other states, we should allow this. Whoops. All right, what about traditional public schools? I have a recommendation for them. We should free them from high stakes standardized testing. We should allow school boards to choose annual norm reference tests from a state approved list and report those test score results to parents. We should allow local school boards to choose whether they administer the state tests that teaches the state curriculum. Public school systems, like every other education provider, will be held accountable by families exercising choice and by their competitors. Of course, this is gonna depend on waivers from the US Department of Education that are allowable per federal law. But if we had universal school choice of the kind I just said, we would have a much better policy case than we do right now to say that these public schools are gonna be held accountable, right? And I was actually talking about it at Harvard the other day with Betsy DeVos. I'm the one in the pretty blue dress. I'm the other guy, right? I'm just kidding. She was asking me about the governor's race um, and the prospects for school choice. Educators have been screaming at the mountaintops since centralized accountability came in, that it was narrowing the curriculum, that they were teaching to the test, that it was getting rid of recess and PE. Right? I have four kids in public school. They would laugh if you asked them what recess is. They're like, what's that? Right? <coughs> we know the downsides of this, right? We were told on the front end that whenever you have a performance metric, you're gonna get more of that metric to the detriment of other things that are valuable. And the new research shows that 
focusing on high stakes standardized testing is crowding out non-cognitive skills that are actually valuable in later life outcomes, including labor market outcomes. There's only one way to get out of this. There's three choices for accountability, right? We can go back to the 1990s and trust that the 13 layer cake is gonna do right for our kids. That's what traditional public schools, they don't phrase it this way, obviously, but that's what they're asking for, trust us. I don't think that's politically tenable. I don't think your average parent, your average citizen, and certainly not the business community, wants to go back to that. <clears throat> That's one option. Go back to what we had before in the 1990s and before. Second option, stay with No Child Left Behind style accountability. Have high stakes testing, have rewards when schools do well, <clears throat> have interventions when schools do poorly. But I think that has real downsides. And I'm telling you, as a public school parent, it is very unpopular with parents. And it's super unpopular with kids, right? Third, <clears throat> universal educational choice, right? It's working well in Arizona. Here's what I want for accountability under Georgia 2020, a system of universal educational choice. With enough choice, Parents will be able to hold public schools and private schools and charter schools and cyber schools accountable by deciding where they attend school. But taxpayers have a duty and a right to know that their money's being well spent, right? So, how, so here's the, the trick. How can we provide valuable information to parents about how their children are doing and valuable information about their potential alternatives, but at the same time, preserve educators, educators' autonomy to innovate and to accommodate the unique needs of individual students, as opposed to opposing a stultifying and manipulable system of largely multiple choice tests. Right? Is it possible to do these simultaneously? Just like the guy, the weird guy, who figured out a better way to do service departments where you fix cars, there's some educator, I'll make up a fake name, in Lumpkin County, that can't be real, right? There's some educator in Lumpkin County. She has a great idea, but she's not gonna even try to take it up the 13 layer cake because she knows the answer is gonna be no or even a, a more vulgar form of no, vulgar form of no, right? And so it's ne we're never gonna see that idea. Maybe that idea is good, maybe that idea is bad, right? But universal educational choice will allow educators that don't like what's going on in their schools to hang the shingle and start their own. Or they'll be able to go work at another school that does share their vision, right? Right now, 95% of students are in the 13 layer cake system, governed by 13 layers of politics and bureaucracy. So educators don't have much choice for themselves on what to do to, to implement their ideas. So how can we do this? How can we give valuable information to parents let taxpayers hold schools accountable, but also preserve innovation and educator industry. I want to require all schools that serve students with taxpayer subsidies, traditional public schools, charter schools, private schools, to administer norm reference tests in reading and math to students in grades three and above and report the results only to parents. So parents will know how their child is doing. I actually don't even support this recommendation, but I'm making it anyway. Do you know why I don't support it? Because private schools do it anyway. I had Jeff Jackson, the head of the Georgia Independent School Association a couple of years ago. I said, survey your private schools, your association, and how many of them test annually in reading and math? Do you know what the answer was? All of them. A couple didn't, and they served very uh, intense special needs students. Other than that, all of them give norm reference tests without a state mandate. Oh, you know what's interesting? Arizona, and, and there's a caveat I'll say at the end, but Arizona, in their five school choice programs that have been operating, they don't require norm reference testing. And the rails didn't come off, right? The rails didn't come off. But I know there's a technocratic impulse, especially on the Republican side, right? So this is for you. Right? 
mandate what's going to happen anyway, because parents want to see those scores anyway. I don't see any harm there. Second, civil society should promote crowdsourcing uh, tools like great schools and private schools review, right? Crowdsourcing is how young people find good providers now, right? They're used to this, right? How many of you have used Yelp? Raise your hand to find anything. Adam, can I steal your line? Adam Peshek, <laughs> who works for Ryan Mahoney, like way below Ryan though, uh, for Jeb Bush. Well, Ryan works here, then Jeb Bush works for him, and then Adam's like you know, four or five levels down. He has this great line when he speaks publicly. He says, the last time you looked for a restaurant and you used Yelp, did you also go to the government website and look at the health department data? Right? But now Yelp is linking to that. I'm not saying there shouldn't be a health department, right? But what are you using now, right? Restaurants have an incentive not to kill you, right? Because they want to have repeat business, right? The only thing I would mandate here is I would make schools that receive students that have taxpayer subsidies put three things somewhere on their website. What's their tuition and fees? How many students they have last year? And how many teachers do they have last year? And then these websites can scrape that data off the web. And these websites, they want more data than that. And private schools will have an incentive, and charter schools and traditional public schools will have an incentive to disclose that so that it's not blank on the website because parents are gonna be looking at these to make school choices. Third, I don't like this one either, and I, I think I hate it worse. But again, I think it's a necessary evil given people's technocratic impulses, right? Require schools to be accredited, right? I teach a university, accreditation is horrible, right? You know, people like Republicans, right, say, oh, you universities are getting all bloated on administration. I remember when I was at Georgia College, we got an email that, oh, we're having a new job search for the Director of Institutional Effectiveness. Director of Institutional Effectiveness for my university. And of course, one of the economists immediately emailed the rest of us and said, that's prima facie evidence that your institution isn't effective <laughs> if you have a Director of Institutional Effectiveness. And so of course, we all were like, this is ridiculous, right? And maybe Jose's right, universities are bloated, blah, blah, blah. Do you know why they had to hire that person? To deal with accreditation that's mandated by the federal government. So, so accreditation is evil, but it will help keep some crazy fly-by-night schools and schools with crazy views out of the marketplace. So how can we keep the good by screening out like the really terrible schools, but, but not impose costly input-based policies? I think Texas has it right. They have confederations of independent schools that have worked with the pu public school associations and they've approved together like 15 accreditors. I would let any group of 20 schools that wants to use an accreditor, I would let that accreditor be, be, be used, be allowed. So, so to have some kind of competition between accreditors. Because if you have just one, two, or three picked by the government, it's just gonna require more input-based policies that cost more and more, like we do in public schools. Next, I think we should collect statewide data on student outcomes. And this data is not tied to a school, it's not tied to a teacher, it's not even tied to a sector. Because once you tie data to something, it gives people bad incentives. Right? It gives people bad incentives. I would look at statewide NAEP test scores. I would look at post-secondary attendance. I'd look at post-secondary success, labor market outcomes, parent satisfaction surveys, Surveys of economic development officials, surveys of business leaders, right? Do this every year, and I would have researchers and nonprofits do this, not state government, just to make sure the rails aren't falling off, right? And then you can make mid-course corrections if you have to, right? When you start tying achievement data to a school or, or anything else, you have a bad incentive. And I'll give you an example. Arizona has passed a new expansion of their education savings accounts that's along the lines of what I want here. It passed and was signed into law last year, but I believe it's under litigation, has not been implemented yet. The new law requires students to get these ESAs to be tested on a norm reference test, along what I said, but it poses one other thing that I don't like, but it might not be too bad. 
What the new Arizona law says is that any parent can request average test scores at a school, and then the schools must provide that to the parent. Right? In real life, if you didn't have that law, and parents requested that data and didn't get it, they might walk away from the school. So you don't need the law. Second thing, and I argued with some of you this 10 years ago when we created the tax credit scholarship, when it was being debated, and thankfully I won the debate then, or I won the argument then. What are you going to do with that data? If you have average test scores data at a school, what does that tell you? It doesn't tell you about the value added of the school. It tells you something about the quality of the peers. By reporting data, when states started doing these report cards, there's evidence that that caused increased sorting by race and class across public schools. What we've done in this country is we've made all public schools the same. Right? We've equalized the funding, which I'm, I support. We've given the same curriculum, the same tests. So how are parents going to choose traditional public schools? They're going to look for schools with the best peers in the most expensive neighborhood they can afford. Who's going to win under that plan? People with money. Who's going to lose? Everyone else. I wrote a paper on this called The Integration Anomaly. Every part of American society is becoming more integrated, except for one, traditional public schools. Intermarriage, adoption, neighborhoods. American neighborhoods have gotten tremendously more integrated since 1970. But public schools are becoming more segregated. Right? It's because we've homogenized them. So the only way you can sort is by choosing peers and by collecting this achievement data and taking it to a school, what you're going to do is exacerbate that problem under a choice system. And that's happened in some other countries. We can learn from choice in other countries. I talk about it in the report. Almost every other rich country on earth has way more school choice than us. The only one that doesn't is Greece. Greece. That's a good model for us. Right? So collect this data at the statewide level do it by subgroups, have nerds do it that don't work for the state, and just to make sure everything's going okay. Fiscal issues. I remember when I got the job to be the education advisor to Governor Purdue. I was just a punk professor, right? And I'd worked on the side for two years for Governor Barnes. I was kind of stunned and I didn't know what to do. So I went to go see one of Governor Barnes' henchmen. Trust me, they were henchmen. <laughs> they were men and they were mean. Right? And I said, what do I do? And he was upset because they had lost, and I understand that. He said, Ben, you're going to go in there with your charts, and your facts, and your figures, and your logic, and it doesn't matter because all that matters is the money. That's all they care about. And what he meant was the public school lobbies. All they cared about was the money. All right, so let's talk about the money. That's what I'm going to conclude with. This is fiscal year 2016 data. Traditional public schools in Georgia spend 11,000 per student and change. Tax credit scholarship, the average one is about a third of that. The average special needs scholarship is half that. Why in the world are we focused on these two sectors causing us fiscal problems? I've written some complicated papers on this, and I've probably spoken to some of you about this publicly, but I've kind of learned this is pretty simple, right? If kids move from this sector to these sectors, how in the world is that going to make taxpayers worse off, right? I've heard some state legislators make the same metaphor, right? They say federal taxpayers are the same as state taxpayers, the same as local taxpayers. You just take the money out of a different pocket, right? But I understand there's a challenge here, right? And so I'll talk about that. Georgia 2020 will impose a fiscal cost on the state. The two big fiscal costs of what I proposed would be in state-approved charter schools that are getting more money, because in Georgia, the charter schools approved by the state don't get local money. They get something called a state supplement that's supposed to mimic what local funds are. It's way less than local funds typically, but um, uh, that's funded by the state. So having charter schools achieve parity with traditional public schools is going to be a fiscal cost to the state for charter schools approved by the state. Second big fiscal cost is going to be from giving special needs students ESAs and special needs vouchers, right? I'm not denying that's a fiscal cost to the state. But when you pull kids out of public schools, that's going to save local taxpayers money. 
And when I was talking about another paper I wrote at Harvard the other day, my discussant said, no, 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 no. Public schools can't save money when the kids leave. This was a professor at the University of Washington said this. She was not an economist. And uh, she said, you know, we studied Detroit, and they've lost a lot of kids, and they really can't cut costs. And before I could respond, the guy next to me was an economist at University of Missouri. Right? What's going on at University of Missouri in the last few years? Remember that professor? There was some protest, and there was a student reporter, you know, these pesky reporters, that wanted to, like, cover the protest. And the professor said, hey, can we get some muscle over here to get rid of this student reporter? That wasn't the problem. The problem was the way the university reacted. Enrollment of first-time freshmen at University of Missouri is down 30%, 30%, and now 30% again. What this professor said was, yeah, we didn't think we could cut costs either, but guess what? They've sold the business school, and we're moving to an old dorm. They've sold property on the periphery of University of Missouri, and they have not hired, and they've laid off staff. He said if we keep getting first-time freshman enrollment down 30%, our physical footprint is going to be 30% lower, and the number of staff is going to be 30% lower. Anyone can cut costs when they have to, but they don't want to, and I understand that. But you cut costs when you have to. So yes, a couple of these programs will impose a fiscal cost on the state, but it's going to save local taxpayers money because they're serving fewer students. Look, Georgia state policymakers if history is any guide, are going to put more money into education. This has been going on for a century. Yes, during the Great Recession, there was historic funding challenges for people, for universities, for public schools. And those cuts were real, and I put them on the screen earlier. But since that time, the money spigot is back on. In 2014, and this is just state funds, it's not local funds or federal funds going to public schools. It's in Georgia, state funds, 7.6 billion, then 8.1 billion, 8.6 billion. It stops in 2016. In 2017, we know from news accounts and from reading budgets, there was a big increase in state funding for public schools. 2018, big increase in state funding for public schools. Governor Deal's proposing a big increase in 2019. Right? This is back to the historical pattern. So the state, they're going to put more money into public educa into education, into K-12 education. Where do they think is the best investment for those funds? Keep giving it to the 13-layer cake? And just to be clear, I'm not blaming the people at the bottom for the 13-layer cake. It's the system. Do we think that's the best investment for our funds? Or do we think the best investment for our funds is to give dignity and educational choices to the bourgeoisie. Are we going to respect the choices of individual people and individual educators and let them decide? In time for fall 2020, I think Georgia could, could adopt these recommendations to create a system of universal educational choice. Bourgeois families. There's a bunch of economic histories that have come out recently, and one of them talked about what was the, actually both of them, one of them was the three book trilogy that's each one, book's about that thick. I did not read it all. And the other one was a book written by a Nobel Prize winning economist when he won his award. They all kind of write a book after that. What they both found is about 300 years ago, most people in the world, most people in the world about 300 years ago, lived two steps away from subsistence. Over 99% of people. We've had this tremendous increase in human well-being over the last 300 years. Why? Both of them concluded from looking at history, it wasn't the big inventions, it wasn't having good institutions, it was allowing the bourgeoisie to make billions of small innovations every day. That's what led to the great increase in human well-being. Right? What I mean by this for education is let's allow families, the bourgeois families, to use their own funds and the taxpayer funds devoted to their child's education and let them choose the schools and non-school education services they think are best for their children. Let bourgeois educators not have to ask permission to offer their best versions of school and non-school services to the public and then let the public choose it or not. I want to conclude with thank you for coming and I think all of these 
uh, proposals are politically realistic. I'll tell you why. Wisconsin's doing it. Florida's doing it. Indiana's doing it. Arizona's doing it. Right? And there's a bunch of other states. Uh, these guys are all sitting right here. They're flying around. A bunch of other states are considering this. We were a leader in 2008 in school choice. We are not anymore, not even close. Thank you.